sharing. Okay, it looks like we're live. I'm just going to wait a second or two just so that it can fully pop up and people can find it on Facebook. I can see that. Okay, so we can begin. Hello, welcome to Esposito Public Library's virtual author chat series. This panel is in partnership with Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore. I'm one of your hosts, Jessica Buck, and today with me is Teen Services Librarian, Kathy Janovitz. Did I do it right this time, Kathy? You did, good job. <laughs> and hello. I um, said it wrong forever, she never told me. <laughs> it's, it's that's probably how they pronounce it in the old country. But you know, you move here and then you pronounce the J differently. At least I assume, I don't know. <laughs> but hello today, our panelists for this chat are Emily Collin, Shannon Price, uh, Ka um, Caitlin Sangster and Adrian Tooley. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you can order and pre-order books by the authors from Serious Galaxy Bookstore. Links are going to be put in the chat description. And if you have any questions for our authors, please feel free to add those to the comments. Appropriate questions only. No personal questions. Creepy <laughs> personal questions. We don't do those. <laughs> but everything else we do, yeah. Yes, please feel free to add those questions and we will get to those as they kind of pop up. So we're just going to start with a little basic introduction. So why don't you just tell us all about you? Maybe there's viewers watching that don't know who you are, or maybe there's viewers that know who you are. And I guess let's start with Emily. So tell us a little bit about you. Oh boy, okay. Um, well, so I am originally from uh, Brooklyn, New York. That's where I grew up and then finished high school in um, New Zealand and then came back uh, to the United States for college and here I've been. Um, I started out actually writing um, romantic uh, women's fiction in my career with a supernatural twist um, and was lucky to have my first book be a New York Times bestseller and target emerging authors pick. So that surprised me. No one was more surprised than me, but also it made me um, feel happy and very lucky. Um, and I love, 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 love um, YA literature. And so got inspired to start writing some of my own after reading book after book that I just admired and loved. And my first book um, that I wrote is um, Sword of the Seven Sins, which is this. And um, it was a, um, for, oopsie, it's duplicated. Um, it was a four, oh. yeah, oh, it's everywhere. Um, it was a four word um, Indies Award finalist, which I was very um, excited about. It's always uh, challenging when you're making the kind of cross genre switch, um, but it's a trilogy. So I'm in the midst of that right now. And um, yeah, I live in coastal North Carolina with um, a dog who thinks he's a cat and a cat who thinks he's a dog and a kid who does parkour. And that's me. Fabulous. I love it. Okay. How about Caitlin? Tell us a little bit about you. Sure. I just muted myself and then you, you caught me. So I'm Caitlin. <laughs> I, um, I grew up in Northern California, the part with all of the hills and trees and lakes and stuff. So not the beach and not the big buildings. Um, you couldn't see people's houses from my house. And I actually miss that. I live in um, the, sh the Chicago suburbs now and I'm missing those trees and the mountains. Oh my goodness, it's so flat here, <laughs> but it is a really cool place to be. Um, I, let's see, what did Emily say about herself? I never know how to answer this question. <laughs> I, um, so I grew up in California. I went to school in Utah. I have a degree in Asian studies. Um, I lived in China and Taiwan. Um, and Montana, which is just as much of a foreign country. And then now I live in Chicago. I started out writing post-apocalyptic fiction and I'm sure that there are copies of my book floating around somewhere. Last Star Burning was my first book. It's actually the first book I ever wrote. So I got really, really super lucky and, and got to get that one published. It's a trilogy. It was really fun. Maybe not as fun right now since it's centered around a pandemic where everybody has to wear masks and like run away run away from sickness and so it's maybe a little too close to home <laughs> but 
I um, have a new book coming out called Two Rides the Storm. It is fantasy. There's no masks or pandemic happening in it. And I'm really super excited about it. I'm, I've always wanted to write YA fantasy. I don't know why I started out in, um, in post-apocalyptic fiction. Maybe that's just what the thing I was reading at the time, but I'm super excited to make that transition. Thank you. Okay, now Adrian. Hey, hi, I'm Adrian Tooley. Um, and first and foremost, this is definitely not my real background. So just to clarify, my bookshelves are not this organized. I just need to be clear about that up front. Um, I actually grew up in Southern California um, in Temecula, which is pretty close to Escondido. So when y'all reached out, I got really excited. I was like, I know where that is. Um, and I have lived in New York for the last eight years or so. So I currently live in Brooklyn with my wife and all of our musical instruments. Um, my debut, Sweet and Bitter Magic, came out in March. I have to hold it specifically so it doesn't disappear into the background. Um, but just like Caitlin said, maybe like a little on the nose because there is a magical plague and everyone's kind of suspicious of each other. And like, it, it was a really a little on the nose. Or my copy editor at one point was like, this feels a little much right now. This is a little too accurate. So I uh, feel your pain there. Um, but I'm so excited to be here. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. We're excited to have you. And last but not least, Shannon. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Shannon. I am a YA author. Um, my first book, which I completely forgot to grab, is called um, A Thousand Fires. Um, it was a YA retelling of the Iliad set in modern day San Francisco. Um, I am born and raised in the Bay Area, so kind of repping NorCal. I don't think quite as north as as um, you were saying, Caitlin, but we're up there. Um, and my next book, which I have ready here, um, is called The Endless Skies. It comes out on August 17th. And um, perhaps an accidental theme, it's also about a plague, um, or a sickness, rather. It is um, a, a fantasy adventure, a race against time, where a group of shape-shifting warriors have to go and uh, find a cure for a magical or for a disease that is ravaging through their city um yes oh my gosh so fun so fun to write um and yeah I uh let's see went to school here in the Bay Area I live here in the Bay Area and I have the most beautiful dog in the whole world I'm completely obsessed with her and her. uh that's Where's who I dog? hang out with she's downstairs it's she would be like she would be right in this panel but um yeah, so I like to hang out with her when I'm not writing and she's a great, great cuddle buddy when I get stuck on a chapter or a paragraph or something. She's always good to, to have around. That's me. Well, thank you for um, telling us all a little bit about yourself. Let's see. So our next question, what was your journey to become a writer? If you want us to go in order, I'll just start again. I'll be the sacrificial guinea pig, sacrificial lamb. I don't know. I've, I've mixed Let's my animals. I've mixed my animals. Um, yeah, so my journey to becoming a writer, um, I think surprises even me. Um, so I had started out and I used to write all the time. I was super, super, super shy. And I think books felt really safe for me um, when I was growing up and I would escape into their pages all the time. And I remember like just sitting in this little um, kitty pool that was our reading corner in kindergarten and like watching all the kids run around stabbing each other with pencils as they do in Brooklyn Public Schools and just being like, why would you do that when I could just be right here reading and you could be with me? Y'all are just read, 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 why? Um, so I always wrote and like, um, I like was the kind of kid where instead of having um, clothes scattered all over my floor or whatever else, it was paper because I was writing stuff by hand. Like I would literally walk on my stories to get in and out of my room. Um, and so I always wrote and then I got to college and I thought, oh, well, I should study something that isn't writing because I've spent so much time doing writing. I should open my eyes to something else. And so I did and I was enjoying that. But um, sort of my junior year, I took this seminar because a friend of mine encouraged me to take it. Um, and it was a, a writing seminar and my school, which was Duke, it was like fancy schmancy, whatever. And I had gone to a New York City public high school um, where 
We were taught good writing is good writing. It doesn't matter if it's a supermarket paperback. It doesn't matter if it's like some classic, you could judge it on its own merits. Good writing is good writing. And I, I still believe that and I stand by it. I really believe it, but I just was naive and I didn't have it in my head that there was this canon that was acceptable and not acceptable in this fancy schmancy seminar. And so I remember we went around the room and we're all supposed to say our three favorite authors and God knows who I said the first two were. I'm now too traumatized to recall. But the third one that I said that I loved was Anne Rice. And this, I still love Anne Rice, but this terrible silence fell over this cla the classroom, this awful, dreadful silence. And one by one, each student began to like slink a little bit under the table. And the fancy schmancy teacher turned to me and he said, I see. And then all through the semester, the whole rest of the semester, anytime anyone wrote anything remotely popularized or genre or fantasy or anything, he would turn to me and he'd say, I don't know, what do you think? Anne Rice. And it was totally damning. It was the whole semester. And I made up my mind that this dude was not going to make me quit. He wasn't going to make me quit. I was going to stick it. So I stuck with it. But by the end, I was like, okay, I'm still here. But I really believe that clearly I'm not meant to be a writer. I should help other people with their writing. So I became a small press editor and helped get some small presses off the ground. I wrote nonfiction. Um, I worked for nonprofits. And then at one point, I spent many years working for a nonprofit for um, disadvantaged youth. Um, and I loved it. I was passionate about it. Um, and I was sitting in a meeting working with our teaching artists. And I was trying to get them to fill out their timesheets. Trying to get 30 teaching artists to fill out their timesheets is like hurting a bunch of really recalcitrant, semi-intoxicated kittens. It just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And so one of them turned to me and she was like, you know, Emily, I'm so sorry. As an arts administrator, you must just be so frustrated. And it was like this light bulb moment where I realized they had no idea. I'd spent so much of my life writing that I used to be the kid whose floor was papered with stories. And it was kind of like this sort of aha moment where I realized, okay, well, I believe in what I'm doing now and I'm passionate and I love it. I love the kids. I love the art. I could keep doing this and I wouldn't feel like I'd wasted my life or I could take a risk. Um, and I felt like I would never forgive myself if I didn't take the risk because we were telling all these kids living in these dire situations to be brave and open their hearts and engage in the arts. And here was me like, oh, I don't know, should I? Uh, I just felt like I would just be the biggest hypocrite ever and I wouldn't be able to face them. So built up my freelance career and I took a year off and decided I would write. And if at the end of the year I couldn't produce a book, I would go back to work in the nonprofit field. But I did produce a book and the book sold. And that, that was my... Um, first novel, the one that uh, squeaked onto the New York Times list. So um, it was a, a twisted and long journey, but the best part, y'all, this is the best part, and it makes me so happy. Years later, I was at a writing uh, conference, met another writer, we were talking, realized we knew each other, realized of all things that we were in that same seminar together and that he had called her women's fiction all semester and me, Anne Rice, all semester. But both of us stepped away from writing because we were so embarrassed, came back, became writers, she started her own publishing company and he, forgetting her completely, queried her and she had the tremendous pleasure of being able to reject him. So that, that, that's my little twisted story to writing, but um, there's hope. Don't give up on your dreams. That's what I say. I can go next if you, if we're following our, um, our pattern here. I love that just desserts at the end of that story. Um, I, um, I, when I was really young, I loved to read. I was always behind a book. I always had books that were probably inappropriate for my age, hidden under my desk at school. And um, I just always loved it. And I tried writing when I was younger. I remember writing really terrible knockoffs of like the Alana series. It was the same thing, different names, maybe, like maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I, I just loved doing it. And then all through high school, I had like a journal that I kept that was like a terrible, like Bridget Jones-esque, I'm making fun of my own life type of thing where I would just tongue in cheek, write funny things that happened that weren't all the way true, but were a funny take on what had happened to me. And then like through high school and through college, I didn't really think of being a writer as a career that people had. Like I looked at books on the bookshelves and the bookstores and the libraries and I was like, those came from magical fairies somewhere. They're too perfect for anyone to have actually written. I don't know who does that, but it couldn't possibly be me. And um, 
my sister, actually, my older sister is also a writer and was really focused on getting published. And I remember watching her write and get rejected over and over and over again and being like, yeah, see, it's, it's not a thing real people do. Like, this isn't a real career. And then she got a book published. And I was like, oh, oh, I could do this. And so I started writing seriously. And um, like, I, I had young kids at the time. So I told my husband, I'm like, I'm leaving for a couple of hours every evening you get to take care of these guys and I'm just I'm going to disappear. And so I went to the library and I wrote and I, in my head, just knew I wanted to be published. I didn't want to self-publish. I didn't want to just write for fun. I wanted to be on those bookshelves at the bookstore that I'd always looked at and thought of as being too perfect. And um, it took so many years. <laughs> like I don't have a formal degree in English at all. And I, I always felt so small whenever I went to like talk to other people about writing or wanting to be an author because they'd be like, I have a degree in English or I have a degree in this or I did this. And I'm like, I can speak Chinese. It doesn't help. Um, and it, it took a really long time. And I feel like being patient is like all writers superpower because we spend so much time like writing and not getting any validation from it except for like just liking what we write and then like being on submission to agents who ignore us and then being on submission to editors who also ignore us or just give us friendly no I don't actually like your work enough to you know to, to accept it <laughs> um but then finally when we when we finally get there and get to see our books on the shelves it's like this this huge amazing thing so that's what happens to me is it's something that I did not expect even though I'd always loved doing it and then slowly worked my way into um I feel like I have kind of a similar journey as well like growing up I was definitely the bookworm always had the book in my backpack in my bag wherever I went we went to this you know, to sports games with my brother and I have my book, like family gatherings, I'm in the corner. Um, and I, I also kept a journal very diligently from the age of five to 19. So my parents' house has this like massive Tupperware with just all of these composition notebooks and like glittery journals from when I was eight, like writing about how my brother poked me in the eye and we went to Chuck E. Cheese all the way to like my like most devastating teenage heartbreaks. And um, so it's actually really fun. Every time I go back to visit my parents, I'll go back and read it and I'll remember how dramatic I was as a child. And so whenever anyone's like teenagers don't act like that, I'm like, oh no, I have the proof. Um, but I think like kind of similarly, I didn't think that I could write books. Like I think it was something I really desperately wanted to do and therefore knew that if I tried and failed, I would never recover. So for a long time, I was just like, oh, this is a thing I would like to do someday and then didn't do it because I was terrified. Um, and I that worked for a while. And then um, I ended up having, this is like maybe TMI, but I ended up having like a mysterious illness that like put me couch born for like eight months and I couldn't do anything. And I was like, basically you're like organizing my computer files one day and opened up this idea I'd had five years before it was like a book. And the five years that I had gone between writing those two chapters and that moment was, oh, I actually figured out how to fix this. And I was like, well, I have nothing else to do. Let's see what happens. Um, and then once I'd finished writing my first manuscript, I was like, okay, if I've done it once, I can do it again. Um, and so after all of those years of being too afraid and like feeling so vulnerable just by myself while continuing to buy books and read books and love books, um, I was able to finally take that leap because of a mysterious illness that I still don't know what it was. But now we have books. So that's, that's my very strange journey. <laughs> wow, that, that's crazy. And like so cool. I think, you know, all of us so many like so much of us, it's it's a childhood thing. I was definitely um, a writer when I was little. I remember like, you know, those old computers that are just behemoths now, right? Like huge. And, you know, my dad would let me go on for like 30 minutes and I'm just typing it up. I'm pretty sure my first stories were like elf, like Lord of the Rings, elves, fan, like fan fiction basically. of like, here's what I would do if I were an elf princess and like going through my day. Um, but for a long time, I, so I have always been very creative. And for a long time, I was not like a book kid. I was the artsy kid. Um, so in high school, in you know, middle school, I was very much not writing and honestly not reading a lot um, outside of what I had to read for school. And then I eventually got to college and was like, well, I, I don't want to pursue art, you know, as a career. That's not something I feel drawn towards. 
Um, also, I want something that is hope hopefully, you know, going to pay my bills. So like art, like something like English is more accessible. You can kind of get into a lot of fields. So I um, majored in English and then um, ended up specializing in creative writing. I went to Santa Clara University and they had like a track that you could do and you take like a bunch of classes together, um, one of which was creative, like, creative writing. And so I took that track and um, that was when I, I really was starting to formulate my own ideas. And I remember, you know, in some of these classes, I honestly wasn't a very good student because I wasn't paying attention because I was like just writing like in the corner by myself and like the lecture is going on, um, which I told my professor, we, we stayed in touch and I told him that recently. And he's like, that's okay. Like, <laughs> I understand, like it's obviously worked out really well for you. Um, but I think what, what, what eventually got me to thinking about publishing as a career was I had a really rotten first year of college. Um, I hated it. And in retrospect, I didn't do a lot of like work of making friends or trying to meet people. But um, I was miserable. And I was just really, really alone and sad. And then there was just this moment in the spring. So towards the end of my first year of college, I was walking out of the school library and there was just like the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen in my entire life. And I had this epiphany with myself that I said, I'm never going to let anyone make me feel like small ever again. Like I'm just done letting other people like make me feel alone or like excluded or all these things. And part of that was like, damn it, like I'm gonna get published. Like this is what I'm going to do. And so I went home that summer and I went to my local library and I checked out every single book that they had on publishing. I just cleared the shelf. And I read them all and I wrote down the advice that overlapped. So, you know, how to, how to approach agents or, you know, what to look for when you're looking for an agent, how to spot the bad one, all that sort of stuff. And then I cross-checked it with, it was very methodical in, in retrospect also. It was like, yep, got to get this data, got to cross-check it against the internet. Um, and then I, uh, out of college, I only worked part-time. I found a a very cheap apartment in San Francisco, which I guarantee you is not the price it is anymore. Um, but I was able to work part time. And so I was writing and I eventually wrote my first manuscript and queried agents according to another methodical approach um, recommended in all those books that I got from the library. And so I was a slush pile find and, and signed with my agent out of a cold query, um, which is becoming rarer nowadays. You hear fewer stories like that, but um, yeah, so that that was really, it, it was a bad experience my first year of college, but ultimately it was really like the fire I needed to just buckle down and approach it really seriously as a career and not just as something I kind of did in my, in my off time. Because it is, it's an industry, it's a business, it's a career, and you do kind of need to understand that if you're going to be really serious about it. Thank you so much for sharing about your journeys and your life story. It's it's wonderful for us and I think the viewers to kind of hear how you became a writer. So it's really nice to hear. And thank you, Shannon, for sharing all about how tough it was. Like college sometimes can kick your booty. <laughs> so our next question is just for maybe those who haven't picked up your books or they're thinking about it. Tell them just a little bit about it. It doesn't have to be your elevator pitch, but just kind of Tell us a little bit about um, your book that's coming out or just came out. And should we do the same? Start with Emily. Like, sure, why not? There we go. Sorry. I was like, yes, if I can manage to unmute myself, sure, you can do that. If not, eh. um, yeah. So talk about being a book being um, on the nose. Um, I have to say this parenthetically before I start. So I was just on this uh, panel um, for Why Thriller Con, I guess it was last week, maybe with these wonderful, wonderful um, authors. And we were talking about genre overlapping books, genre blending books. And specifically it was like fantasy and dystopian and sci-fi and like how those blends come together. And um, that is how this particular book is. It's a, it's a complete moosh, it's a blend. Um, but um, with this series that I'm writing, it's about a world that is ruled by the seven deadly sins. So people live and die by these seven deadly sins and the punishment for violating or committing any of these sins is extremely dire. And um, 
lust is of course forbidden being a seven deadly sin um but love is also forbidden um and so it's punishable by death in fact or exile and my two main characters who are warriors one of them a very reluctant warrior falls in love um and um in terms of where it came from it came from um it was in the run-up to the 2016 election, actually, um, in the United States, which was a rough time for me in my head and outside my head. Um, and I just began to think about, you know, as writers, I think sometimes we process our anxiety through our creativity, or maybe that's just me. I don't know. I process my anxiety sometimes through my creativity. And I started to think about, you know, what would happen if, um, he who should not be named would win our election in the United States. How would this play out? And I started to think, well, what if he's not just himself? What if he's a front for white supremacists? And what if by him coming to power, these white supremacists feel completely empowered to crawl out of the woodwork? And what if he pulls out of all the climate agreements? And what if everything becomes completely destabilized as a result? And everyone around me told me I was completely crazy. He was not going to win it. And if he did, none of this would ever happen. But as a Jew living in the South, I felt like I was seeing it kind of all around myself with different eyes. And I thought it was very possible. And so I decided that I was going to write this series. And so it was this collision of the seven sins concept with this other concept, but I think I should say parenthetically, and maybe this is true for the rest of you who are talking about your post-apocalyptic books as well. I know we did find it to be true on this panel, so I don't know what y'all think, but we talked about, is it hard to bring out a book that deals with these darker themes in the midst of a darker theme for the world? And for me, what I thought, and I don't, I'd love to know what y'all think too, but for me, what I thought was like, I wrote my book to be ultimately about hope. I wrote my book to be ultimately about the idea that even in the darkest times, if you have the courage to stand up for what's right and not just fall in with those around you, that the world can be different and the world can be better. So even though I did bring out a book that's a romantic dystopian with strong fantasy elements in the midst of a global pandemic, I felt like it was okay because it's it was about hope and changing the world and not accepting that when things around you are falling apart, you have to fall apart too. So that's what the series is about. And um, it, the second one comes out August 3rd and I've been having a lot of fun with it. I love that idea of, um, especially with dystopia of hope being the centerpiece. Cause I feel like that's a very YA thing too, because um, I mean, who are the people who believe they can change the world the most? It's teenagers and people who are young and who don't feel all of like the the scary complexity and are just like, it needs to change. And so we're going to do it. You know, I love that about YA especially. Um, and I feel that way about my books too. The last one actually came out in 2019. So it was right before the pandemic started. And I feel like I should get like clairvoyance points or like something, I don't know. But um, it is kind of difficult though, to read about something happening in a book that is like maybe amped up to the nth degree but is still an echo of what you're experiencing in your real life it's much less escapist if you're like reading about the hunger games if somebody's actually trying to kill you right um but I, I hope that people draw those themes from books like that though because I feel like the characters in those books the way they act is the way that I've been trying to act myself during dark times or like the pandemic or, or just trying to deal with things with hope so I really love that you brought that up um, my new book that's coming out is not a dystopia. After I was finished with that dystopia series, I was like, I need a little less darkness, please. <laughs> I'd like to add some light, maybe. I don't know if I actually did that with this book because it's very complicated and lots of difficult stuff happens in it, but it's really fun. It's kind of like, uh, it's a fantasy heist that is sort of got Indiana Jones meets Mistborn kind of vibes. Um, it has four main characters. Um, one is looking for answers about the man who killed her brother. She's actually hunting for him and wants to return the favor. Um, one is being haunted by the ghost of his sister. One is trying to escape a life that was chosen for her. And one is dying of a magical wasting disease. So I guess we can't really get away from the dying of diseases thing in the, any of these books. And all four believe that the answer to their problem is down at the bottom of this tomb. 
Um, it's a cursed sword that they're all trying to steal from the same shapeshifter tomb. That's why I got excited about shapeshifters. I love shapeshifter stories. Um, and they're all fighting both kind of each other and a warlord who's trying to excavate the tomb and get the sword for herself. So they're all sort of at odds with each other and stealing things. And it's, it's really fun. And then the thing that I had the most fun writing about it that didn't make sense, that, that sentence I just said, but I hope you got the gist of what I meant, um, was being able to write characters who, who are much more brave and much more apt to like, to be able to do things in a difficult situation than I can. They're all uh, much more likely to deal with a difficult situation than I am. And that's one of the fun things about writing for me is I'm like, I would probably just duck my head and deal with it, but all of my characters don't do that. And that's my book. She Rides the Storm, Fantasy Heist, yes. Well, that sounds amazing. I'm so excited to read it. Um, my recent release, Sweet and Bitter Magic, is a YA fantasy about a witch who has been cursed to never feel love um, in any capacity. So romantic, familial, platonic, she can't love a sunset, she can't smell a flower, basically anything that could bring her joy or a moment of pleasure uh, has been stripped from her because of a childhood transgression that got her banished from her home. Um, and so she is reluctantly coerced by a girl who has been secretly hiding her own magic from uh, the coven that, that runs all of the, the magical beings in the country. She's been hiding it so she can care for her father. Um, so the witch and this girl made of magic are essentially going to team up to try to find the source of this memory stealing plague um, and, and end all of that. And in return, they will receive a boon from the witch's coven, which um, they both think that they are going to get. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a sunshine grumpy trope, a uh, little bit of a road trip through magical land. Um, a little bit more whimsical and lighthearted than memory stealing plague might imply. Um, but it was such a, a joy to write, a fun challenge to write, um, and it does feature a sapphic romance. Uh, so I think that's all my like high level, high level book pitch. You would think it gets easier, but I feel like it never really gets easier to pitch your book. So um, tropes and general plot, hopefully that was, that was enough. <laughs> Well, I agree. It never gets easier. And I, having just finished your book recently, can totally attest it balances the whimsy and is not all doom and gloom. Um, I was like smiling reading it. It was so much fun. Um, my book, uh, so The Endless Skies comes out on August 17th, just under a month away. Um, it is a story about, as told from three point of view, we have our main character, Rowan, who has been training her whole life to uh, be a warrior of, on this magical floating island called the Heliana. And um, before she can take the oath to, to do that, a disease strikes the city's children and they discover that the only cure that could possibly uh, save them lies deep within the enemy lands. And so the story is kind of a race against time adventure about these warriors going out to go try to find this cure and um again so uh, i'm trying to think of all the things that i talked about um it's uh yeah race against time adventure it's great for if you like adrian young's book stop it to hear i mean talk about elevator pitch i'm like literally thinking of what my own book is about um but let's see oh three point of view so another point of view we get is callan who is my Rowan's best friend. And he's like, just realized he is in love with her. So he's like grappling with his feelings as this crisis is unfolding. And then our last point of view is uh, Rowan's older sister, Shireen, who is kind of played by the rules her whole life, made it to the tippy top and is now um, on the King's council. And so she is sort of this figurehead who has to deal with all the people who are panicking, obviously worried about their loved ones and 
um, the kind of pressure that she has to deal with to, to navigate that. So um, it is a story, I mean, again, kind of the accidental theme, it is a story about a disease. Um, it was not at all my, my intention to write a book about a disease during a global pandemic. Um, I've had this idea since 2013. Um, and so it, it's kind of been playing in my head for a really long time. And then um, for better or worse, it was supposed to come out in 2020. And then we pushed it um, in January of 2020 due to other factors. And then of course, a couple months later, it's like, yes, that was the right choice. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's, I'm very excited for it to come out because it's a long time coming. And um, I love what you said, Emily, about it being a story about hope um, because that's honestly what the characters really cling to is, is they at first don't know what this disease is. And then they find out, yes, there is a cure. We just have to find it. And then characters go out to go get it and then people are waiting back at home thinking like we just have to wait we just have to hold on and sort of navigating that hope during every little you know update or every little change and new information that you get um and i ultimately do think it is a very hopeful book you know i revised it really heavily last summer and was channeling a lot of my my feelings about the pandemic into it. And I think that really comes through most in the character of Shireen, who is again, the one on the King's Council, who sort of is like, well, we're, we're in this, like, what do I do? How do I not despair? And um, ultimately you see them have to challenge themselves and, and overcome it in ways that they didn't really think were possible when they uh, first started, the, when the book first starts. So um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. There's some romance in it. There's a lot of action and it's really fast paced. So, uh, and there's, winged lion shapeshifters, as Caitlin um, uh, mentioned. So if you think that sounds cool, I think it sounds cool. Um, this is something that you should read. Thank you for talking about your books. It's really easy for us just to like read the summary, but I think people enjoy it so much more when they get to hear you talk about it because it makes them just so much more excited. You're muted. <laughs> I don't usually mute myself, so I always forget. But my well, I was making ringing. signals as if you knew what that meant. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. My phone just keeps ringing, and it's like this weird phone number. It's very strange. Um, let's see. What's our next question? I know I saw it here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Jessica. So um, I know you've talked about the books themselves, but um, what inspired you to write these particular stories? What were the challenges to bringing them to life? Um, well, so we're still going in this order. So, I mean, I, I think I kind of alluded to that a little bit previously um, in my previous answer about what inspired me to write this particular story. Um, and, you know, I knew I love enemies to lovers. That's one of my very favorite tropes. Um, I love forbidden love. That's another favorite trope of mine. Um, so I knew that I wanted to incorporate that. And I also love the idea of these two um, characters who just even the brush of their hands is completely forbidden. I felt like it would make their love story so much more intense. Um, because they don't even really know what love is, but they know that this is what they're starting to feel for each other. Um, so um, for me, um, the inspiration was, like I said, really that collision of thinking like, okay, I love, I'm drawn to extremes in my writing a lot, I feel. Like just putting my characters in the most extreme situations possible, I'm so mean. And finding out what's gonna happen to them. And I thought like, what's more extreme than, you know, greed and pride and lust and gluttony, like, these are all very human things, you know, they're called sins, but we all, you know, um, fall prey to most of them, if not all of them at one time or another. So what happens if you're in this place where like embracing any of these at all is going to lead to your undoing? So that was really in my mind, just this very natural ability to create this tremendously taught dynamic. Um, for my characters, I think the challenge of bringing them to life, um, I had the first line of the story come to me, just like came to me and I knew like this was gonna be the first line and I knew what the first scene was going to be. 
And then I had to really think about, I didn't start it to make it be a romantic dystopian. It just so happened that a world in which people live and die by the rules of the seven deadly sins is like inherently dystopian. So I think that was a big challenge for me was thinking about, okay, I don't want it to be just another dystopian story. I want it to be different. I want it to lean more heavily on this sins component than on the dystopian component. And I want it to feel unique and not just a recapitulation. So how can I do that? The characters themselves felt really vivid for me. Um, but one of the challenges was creating a world that felt new and fresh and different. Um, so my books, what inspired me to write She Who Rides the Storm, I mean, there are so many things that go into any book, but one of the things was just how much I love heist stories. I have always wanted to write one. I am definitely not smart enough to write one because people who pull off heists are super smart. <laughs> and I reckon, I realized that very quickly as I started writing this and I'm like, no, I'm not smart enough. Like these characters are like, they have to figure this out, but it's me who's actually figuring this out. So that was a struggle for me. But um, some other things that I just really wanted to, to work with, one of the things was the magic system. I love magic systems that require a whole lot from the characters, that it's not just like fancy, you get magic, yay, you're special, Gandalf. Um, I wanted it to hurt to have magic, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring that all the way up right now. Another thing is that unicorns, they have really big horns for a reason, right? Everybody talks about how pure and awesome unicorns are, but they must kill people with those horns. And I just really wanted to incorporate that into my story. And um, I, I really wanted to do a big, like large cast, four POVs. Everybody in my little author group makes fun of me because I always take on projects that are so huge. And um, I really just wanted to have that heist, like that fun, everybody gets along. Um, group story where everybody comes to love each other and rely on each other. I really wanted to do both like a, a friends to lovers romance with all that longing that comes from those. And I really wanted to do an enemies to lovers romance and I have four main characters, so it worked out. And like, I just wanted to have all of those elements all in one really incredibly long book. And that's what happened. <laughs> Um, for me, I sort of attacked this book thinking what sort of book would I have wanted to have as a teenager? Um, when I was growing up, there was not a lot of sapphic fiction and even less sapphic fantasy. So when my, my wife likes to joke that I write all of the books that she wishes she'd had at 16. Um, and so that's sort of, I feel like where I'm always sort of starting my stories from is thinking like, what kind of relationship would I would have helped me to see on a page when I was younger? Um, you know, what kind of struggles and personal growth and experiences might I have benefited from seeing someone else go through and and grow from and and change because of? Um, and so I think a little bit of that it, I poured into this this story a bit. So a lot of the sort of dynamic ways that we talk about love. So Sweet and Bitter Magic is at the heart of it, a book about love, um, not just romantic love, but familial love, self-love. Um, and I really, I really wanted to take the time to explore that. And I wanted to be able to look at it through different lenses. Um, I think that when I like look at, I have the two characters, kind of my sunshine and grumpy character, the one who feels everything because she's made of magic. So she gets distracted by birds and the smell and the wind and this. And then you have Tamsin, who's my witch, who, who can't feel anything, who's wearing wool socks in the summer and, and like doesn't even have access to her own heart. And um, I feel like that's sort of like two sides of myself in a way. Like when I was young, I was absolutely like a wren, this like bubbly, big hearted person who just wanted to help and couldn't understand why, you know, people didn't want my help or I wasn't being appreciated for that. Or like, was my love wrong in some way? Um, and then as I, I got older and a little bit more, uh, jaded and cynical, I found myself leaning into more Tams and territory, but just because you are guarding your heart or protecting your heart doesn't mean that you can't open it back up. And that you can't, you know, find ways to to grow and accept love, even if you don't think you deserve it. Um, so at the heart of it, that that was sort of what I hoped to do 
um, with this book. And I, I think for me, one of the biggest challenges was making these two like extraordinarily different points of views work together um, because again, you have that all and nothing happening on both sides. And so how do you make sure that the right observations are coming from the right person and that we're getting the right information from the right narrator at the correct time as anyone who's ever written more than one point of view will tell you. It gets very complicated. And so for those of you with your four points of views, three points of views, how, teach me your ways. I struggled with two, um, but it, it can be its own very puzzling process of like, how do I, how do I make sure that I know everything I need to know, my characters don't know everything they need to know, and the opposite cross lines of communication are all working. So I'd say that was probably my biggest struggle. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. And so my book has three POVs and I feel that really hard because you you want to get it right. And then, you know, oh, if they're both looking at the same thing, like, are they gonna interpret it the same way or like remember it the same way? And it's, um, it gets messy so fast. So I, I feel that very much. Um, my story is, you know, I, I think it did change because I've had this idea for such a long time. It's my oldest story. Like it's kind of grown up with me. And so a lot of the book was influenced just by like, you know, things I experienced in my life. Um, but the characters were very much like me at different stages of my life, I guess. And um, I love what you said, Adrian, about like writing stories that you wish that you had. Um, and so I went to um, a private Catholic high school. I'm so grateful for my education, but like, wow, were there a lot of rules, right? And so the character of Rowan, one of the, her kind of internal conflict um, comes from this tension where she loves being a warrior. She cannot wait to do it. It's a very strict hierarchical system. And like her personality kind of clashes with that. She's very impulsive. She's very just like, let's go, like, let's do it. Um, and so her conflict in the book is when she's, she feels very, really, really strongly that you know, there's a right thing to do. And then there's what she's being told to do. And they're completely separate. And it's like, well, what do you do when the word bristles, what I always come back to, like the part of you is just like resisting um, what you're being told. And I certainly can remember, you know, experiences in my high school where, you know, if you're wearing a jacket, that's not the school jacket, like you'll get in trouble, you know, and it's just little things like that. that just kind of, I remember, honestly, just being kind of the, the tension of like, like, come on, like, this is the right thing or like this is fine and you're not allowed to do it um and then by contrast the character of Shireen who's this like older figure she's about seven years older than her sister um Shireen was really written from a place of trying to like understand other people when and like trying to get behind their motivations because you see both sides of Shireen this kind of public figure that she has to be as the king's voice as like the part of this council to keep people calm and this very scary time and then you see her you know the moment the door shuts and she is just like you know oh, like I cannot handle this weight like I am just as scared as everybody else I'm just as worried as everybody else but I, this that can't leave this room and so you get both sides of that and I thought you know as I'm older as I as I meet new people and kind of go through experiences I'm always thinking you know I'm only seeing one side of something right you never know what other people are going through and I think it's a more mature tone to think that you can better understand people once you really put yourself in, in their shoes and maybe think, why are they thinking like that? Or, or maybe they, they agree with you internally, but they can't say so out loud and sort of navigating that um, ambiguity and that nuance. Um, it definitely did, as I mentioned, make it challenging because um, you know, you, you, I wanted readers obviously to root for, for both characters, right? And then sort of to understand where both of them are coming from. So I couldn't make Rowan this like loud mouth, impulsive, angry girl, because like that, that has a limit. Like you don't, you don't want to read her the whole book and you want to understand, oh, she's this way because she just really wants to help. And then Shireen is very stoic and closed off. And that's, you understand like, well, that's because she has to be like, there's no other choice for her and sort of understanding that um the last challenge I wrote and it was both my favorite thing and one of the mo like more challenging things um there are it, there's a love triangle in the book and I made it a point um it is a personal pet peeve of mine I when 
a love triangle, there's like an obvious winner and like an obvious jerk who like the main character should not be with. Um, it always bothers me because I feel like it, it, it takes me out of the story in a way that I don't enjoy. So um, one of my favorite things I wrote, wrote was two love interests that, that don't suck. Like they're both good matches for your main character and just sort of, um, you know, writing two guys that you can root for, obviously. And, you know, um, that was fun. And then also like, well, like why, you know, you have to think about their character in a really complex way. And like, why would they complement your the main character? Why would they be a good fit for her? And both of them have to be a good choice. And, and both of them, I wanted them to both be a good fit for her. So that was um, really fun to do. And I think I was successful. My readers, my early readers have been pretty mixed on, on whose team they're on. So I take that as a a nod of success. And you guys can tell me, let me know if you have a strong feeling either way once you read the book. I'm very curious. Thank you. I love hearing about what inspired the stories and just things that we never would, would have thought were difficult because when they're finished, they look, they're so fantastic. Like you did such a good job. And Shannon, it was so funny because I went to a private Christian school. So as soon as you talked about like the jacket, I remember where we had to buy like the polo shirt. And if there was any type of logo, we had to buy a patch and then oh, iron no. it on to cover the logo. Oh, I thought you were going to say the sweaters, like what the our sweaters were so itchy, right? And so you could wear this really comfortable oh. thing or you could wear this horrible itchy thing. Yeah, it's real. It's a, it's a struggle. <laughs> And like we couldn't wear patterns. I think that's why as an adult, I'm drawn to anything that's like patterned and wild because I just wasn't allowed when I was growing up. Oh, memories. <laughs> so our next question is kind of getting into your writing and how you come up with everything. So where do you start your story? And this can be in general or with your most recent book. Is it the characters? Is it kind of just like the plot? Do you think about the world? So kind of where do things begin for you? Um, okay, so I think for me, um, it, it all begins for me with the characters, like the emotion <clears throat> between the characters and the connection between the characters and the dynamic between them. and. Um, for me, like every book that I write, no matter whether it's like YA fantasy or romantic women's fiction, like there's always banter and there's always kissing. And that's how you know that it's like one of my books because it's got banter and kissing and then there's always a supernatural piece, right? Um, and so for all of them, for me, I just, I feel like my, um, I love writing the banter and the kissing so much that I feel like I could live in there forever. And so I, it, it usually it'll start with a line of dialogue or it might start with an image like a picture in my head almost um, of these characters doing something or it'll start with an exchange or sometimes it'll start with a feeling but what's always challenging for me and then some kind of like idea around it like some sort of like I don't know what shape that is that that is around it um, but for me the challenging thing for me is that it's very rare that everything then comes into my mind fully formed. Like I have to really sit down and think about, okay, let's take this amorphous feeling and emotion that I have and the way that I know these, I want these characters to be connected. And let's truly think about like their goals and what do they really want and what's in the way of that and what's gonna happen if they don't get that and do their goals conflict? And you know, what do they really need that they don't know they need at the beginning of the story? How are they gonna be changed you know, by the end of it? And I sometimes get so excited about the relationship between the characters that it's like my instinct to go kind of tearing off into the book without really thinking those character worksheets through. But I have discovered for myself that if I don't think that through, I end up with like people bantering and kissing in circles. Like I just, my, my book doesn't kind of flesh out the way that it needs to. So I have a writing partner that I call the plot fairy and she always yells at me, make the stakes higher, make the stakes higher. Um, and so I always have her kind of in my head. And um, so I always have a playlist for each of my books um, and I um, put that music on. I think it comes from, um, when uh, my son was little and I had 20 minutes between when I dropped him off at nursery school and had to be at work to write. And that was my only 20 minutes. And I was like, ah, I need to do something in my only 20 minutes. So I created a playlist that would just drop me into the mood of the book. And I, even though now um, I write and teach full time, I, I have kept that because I think for me, 
even when I'm feeling disconnected from the book, it does this good job of really dropping me into the mood of the story. Um, but it always does start for me with, there's an idea spark that's vague about the outline of the story, but the most vivid piece is an image and a feeling of connection between two characters that I then have to flesh out and explore. It wouldn't unmute. Um, I, I think that there are lots of different elements that came from different places for me. Um, this story, She Who Rides the Storm, if I'm talking about that one, it took a really long time for me to be able to write it because I was con I had other books contracted. And so I, it was on the back burner in the back of my head as a story idea of the thing that I actually wanted to be writing when I had a book that I was supposed to be writing. Um, and it really came from like this feeling, actually. I had this overwhelming feeling as I was listening to something else. A lot of my stories come from that. I'll be listening to or reading to something and it causes me to feel a certain way. Like the story has done a good job in forcing me to like have artificial feelings for the characters who are not real. And um, I want to be able to inspire those feelings in other people. And actually the one from She Who Writes the Storm is not a, it's, it's a true story. I was listening to This American Life and it was a, a story about a man who had been struck by lightning and how his life changed as a result. And um, he like was too frightened to go outside because he felt like nature was like conspiring against him. He felt like if he went outside, then like a storm would find him. And um, the story culminates in him like trying to finally break through it and go to a concert and it started raining and thunder started. And so he goes and hides in his car and he turns on a recorder and you can just hear the rain pounding on his windshield. And it is such a powerful story. You should go look it up. And I was like, I want someone to feel this terrible too. <laughs> and so that's where, where She Who Rides the Storm, like it formed around that idea. And there's a scene in this, in this story that I was trying to recreate the way I felt as I was listening to this other story. I mean, there are no common elements or anything, but I just wanted that like feeling of like something so much larger than you and things being unfair and inevitable and being helpless and like the power. And I just wanted that in a book. And so, um, I mean, that's, I feel like where all my stories come from is I'm listening to something or feeling something. And I'm like, I want to make other people feel like me too. That's where it comes from for me. That's like the coolest answer I've ever heard to that question. I'm like, I like want to hear you talk about that for like an entire podcast or something. Like that's so fascinating. Um, wow, I feel like, how do I follow that? Um, I think that much to the chagrin of my critique partners and my editor, my world building comes last and my characters come first. Um, and a little bit like Emily said, I get this sort of like idea of like a moment in time, it's this person in this place with this thing. And then I'm like, okay, gonna need to build an entire book around that. How do I do that? Which is not easy. It's very hard because you have this great first vivid flash of something and then you have to turn it into an entire book. I don't recommend this. People that like do all of the plotting first and the meticulous world building, call me, teach me your ways. I need help. But um, like for my second book that's coming out next year, um, it's, a, it's a book about a musician. It's a YA fantasy. Um, but all I had was this picture of this girl standing in like a medieval tavern playing a lute. And like she's in the corner while business dealings are going on or something. And I was like, but I want her story. And so that's like how my second book, Sophie and the Bone Song, came to be. And so then I had to figure out, okay, how do I make this a book that people want to read? Because I want to know her story, but like, how do I then craft that? So um, I think a little bit like Emily, it's, it's figuring out then once you have this image and this like general idea, how do you set up the stakes and the... Um, you know, the desires, the wants, the needs, the, the things that they'll, that'll happen if they lose or don't get what they want. And then how do you build a world around them that will essentially make their job really hard? Because without stakes, you have no story and you have no buy-in. So I think I said this on another panel and I like to joke that I like to make my world as like difficult for my characters as possible. I like to just like absolutely ruin their lives because ultimately it makes my life easier because if they're suffering, that means that they have this thing to overcome and they have these things that they have to achieve. 
Um, so that's my really uh, excellent writing advice is just ruin your characters' lives. So I would say that's, that's sort of how I, how I work. As an author, I think you're obligated to ruin your characters' lives. So you're just, you know, par for the course here. Um, I, and uh, similarly, so one thing that I tend to start with um, or, or try to incorporate is there's a um, Pixar storytelling method. You can just Google it. Um, it's very interesting. And I've, I remember one of my biggest takeaways was they said, you know, the start of every movie, the character has everything they, that they want. And then you just take it away from them. You know, think about like the first, what, five minutes of Up? Like we all remember our feeling, right? Like when we watched that. And so um, that's something I always have in my mind, especially when I'm looking at the first chapters or like really trying to start a story is like, well, what would everything look like? And then what would the opposite of that look like? Um, but for me, my, my ideas, both with my last book and this one were inspired by dreams. And I just remember, I mean, these are cool dreams, right? Like I remember like being a magical flying lion and I was in this like dark secluded grotto and I was looking at this other lion and I knew he was the prince and that was all I had. I woke up and I wrote that down. Um, and then again, that was, I think in 2013. So I've, I've had the idea for a while and it just kind of like, I just kind of keep those images in my head and, and the feeling that I experienced in the dream was that we were waiting on a signal. And that was like, we we're just waiting, you know before we flew off somewhere. Um, and for The Endless Skies, another big influence for me was one of my favorite childhood movies. Um, it's Balto, it's like a 1997 animated movie. It's incredible, like I stand by it. I think it's still such a fun movie and a really beautiful score. Um, so one of the things that, that got me thinking was, you know, I, th this is a race against time. It's like a quest that they're leaving to go find this medicine to bring it back to the town. And I'm like, well, what if I, I took that sort of idea and made it into a fantasy? Um, but then again, I sat with that for many years. I wrote my other book before then, you know, sold that, did, did everything. Um, and I sort of wrote these things very piecemeal. Um, and what really solidifies a book idea for me, because I have a lot of ideas. I think most authors have, you know, a couple floating around up there <laughs> at all times. Um, but the ones that like draw it down from the ether in, into, the, into the document or into your, you know, Word, Doc or Scrivener is really for me the names. Um, I cannot write a book if my characters' names are not set. And it's very annoying because I do have to just sort of wait for them to arrive in my head. Like there's no secret sauce. I just like, they will, I know they will come and like they will be there and then they're a fully formed character with the right name. And it's one of the signals to me when a story is not working out um, that maybe one of their names is wrong. And then, you know, you do a control find, control replace. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, that that was their name this whole time. All of a sudden the story flows. So that was certainly true. I remember Rowan, Rowan came to me almost right away, fully formed this fiery, very like impulsive, but like earnest in a really honest way. And um, it took me a bit to, to even give her a nickname. Like one of the characters calls her Ro for short. Um, and even that took some time because I'm like, well, that's not her. Like that's the wrong character. Um, but I warmed up to it. And so yeah, definitely character names and images are probably what I, I work from. Um, I'm a I'm a pantser, like I don't plot, I have tried. So I, I feel your pain on, on not knowing where your story is going. And sometimes it's it's fun and you get to surprise yourself. And other times it's really frustrating because you're just like, well, I'm I'm here, like, I don't know where it's going. And then you just sort of, the story will reveal itself in time. But sometimes it's like, man, if I'd, if I'd planned this, maybe I'd go a little bit faster, but oh well, everyone writes differently. <laughs> Okay. Oh my gosh. So much information. <laughs> okay, let's see. What is our next question? Oh, there it is. Um, have you always been drawn to the fantasy genre? Are there any other genres that you would like to write in in the future? There we go. Um, well, so I have always been drawn to fantasy. Um, so 
My middle name is Anne, and um, when I was little at a birthday party, um, you know how parents pick out gifts they think are like cutesy and they give it to their kids to give to you, right? So somebody gave me um, Anne of Green Gables for my middle name, but also um, Ella Montgomery's other book, Emily of New Moon. And I fell in love with Emily of New Moon, which is so much, it's, it's, it's lesser known for sure. But what I loved about it, it's the first fantasy I ever remember reading because Emily of New Moon, she has this clairvoyance and this voice that speaks to her and she doesn't know who or what it is. Um, and there's a little bit of magical realism, like, is it real? Is it there? Is it not? Um, but I remember just something about that just feeling so magical to me, just feeling so incredible. Um, and then I remember reading A Wrinkle in Time and just loving it and loving the idea that this girl and her brother who were so horribly bullied for being smart could turn it all around and completely save the day. Um, and that science was kind of mixed into it and that, you know, th this world could exist alongside our world and we would have no idea, you know, it would all happen without our knowledge. So um, I think that's why when I when I wrote um, The Memory Thief, which was my very first book, there's a ghost in it um, who um, comes back from the dead basically to keep a promise to his wife. He's a mountain climber. He promises he'll come home from this really dangerous climb and she has a premonition. She says, please don't go, but he's stubborn and he goes and he has to end up possessing somebody else to find his way back to her. And when I wrote that, what was most exciting to me was that fantasy element. It was that supernatural element. Like that's what drew me. And it was so interesting to me because the things that people talked about later that they really loved about the book and the way it got classified was sort of very squarely in this romance genre. And it does fit there. I mean, there is a very um, involved love story. There's speaking of three points of view, there's three points of view in there. And, um, and, and there's the ghost's point of view and there is like the person he possesses is this is this point of view and then there's um the the woman's point of view who said please do not go do this stupid thing which of course he then did um but you know for me it was that ghostly element that kept me writing and my second book is I got a, a time travel piece and then um you know this series in addition to being this romantic dystopian has this fantasy piece so um I think for me since I do write in these two genres um I feel like it makes me very happy and satisfied to write in both. I love writing my, you know, adult kind of romantic women's fiction, which always has a supernatural element and always has uh, lots of kissing. And then I love writing this uh, kind of grittier, darker a little bit YA. It's another side of me. Um, and um, no matter whether it's this romantic dystopian piece or the the book that's coming up behind it which doesn't have any dystopian elements in it at all once this series is done it's still fantastical and i think for me just this idea that something exists beyond what we can see and touch and feel it just makes a book so much more interesting to me and i feel like the only boundaries is um or are the author's imagination and you get to set the rules. Anything can go and you can change the rules. So I think that's what's always drawn me and continues to draw me to writing fantasy. I think I identify with a lot of that as well. Um, fantasy is such a fun place to be. And as somebody who grew up reading and like loving to just fall into fantastical worlds, I I love coming up with, I like making stuff up. I love being able to say, I don't have to follow the rules of the world and I don't have to know the names of the places. And I don't know how to, I don't have to know if rope historically actually was in the world at this particular point in time. Um, I love being able to just make stuff up and then make it work. But I mean, I also really love other fun stuff. Like I have this idea that has been bugging me ever since I started writing the sequel to She Who Rides the Storm, because that's always what happens to me is I'm like, I have to write this book. And so obviously there are three other books that are like, no, 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 you should write me. Um, I have this like Veronica Mars, I need to figure out who killed my best friend contemporary book that's just like at the back of my head Then I'm like, I've never written anything like that before, but it would be really fun to do that. Or like I have this other rom-com idea that occurred to me because a turkey attacked my car like they're just funny random things that 
that inspire me to write in other genres that like, I, I don't think I could put a turkey in a car in a fantasy book. I mean, maybe I could, but I don't want to. I want to put it in a contemporary um, non-fantastical world. So I, I love having the range and like the ideas and, and the capacity to do more than one thing. So that's where I fall on that. We need that turkey book. I know, right? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I think I, I definitely agree with that sort of finding freedom in writing fantasy. Um, you, you don't have to necessarily get so caught up in the logistics and the exact principles, like you said, like, was this type of wood shipped over the ocean to this country? Uh, like, I would spend so much time researching that my book would never get written. So um, I, I personally love that freedom of getting to you know, make suggestions to the improvements of the way that the world is in my own fantasy novels and be like, wouldn't this be nice? Yeah, great. I'm going to write that. Um, so that's always really fun. Um, when I first started writing, I have a couple like shelved contemporary manuscripts and that's sort of how I like started. Um, so I think like someday that would be fun to go back to. And I also, um, I think that like I'll never like I'll always want my work to be like a little bit dark and creepy so I would be very interested in like doing some sort of like speculative horror type thing maybe not like a second world fantasy so maybe more of like a contemporary type um something I've something brewing in the back of my head so maybe one day that will that will actually make it onto the page but yeah I love fantasy and I think I always will I yeah, was right about authors having ideas out there. Everyone does. <laughs> it just matters how many hours are in the day for us to write. Um, yes, I, I've always been drawn to fantasy. I mean, some of my earliest memories are going to my local library and like I knew I knew the way to get there. I didn't even have to think about it, right? You know, you just follow your your muscle memory basically to get to the kids fantasy books and um, the Tortal series um, by Tamara Pierce. Um, the Bruce Koval books, you spoke of unicorns earlier. I don't know if you know the Into the Land of the Unicorns. It's a classic. It's incredible. Um, so I was, I've always gravitated towards those sort of things. And um, when I was thinking seriously about writing, like that is where I wanted to be. And my first book, um, I tried so hard to make it fantasy. I tried, I think probably the first three or four drafts were all um, you know, getting magic that was like Greek God inspired. So each character had like a Greek God kind of sponsoring them. It just didn't work. And so it ended, I ended up writing a contemporary thriller kind of because that's what the story demanded. And then The Endless Skies, which was an idea again that I had prior just sort of came like creeping back. And um, I was really worried if my publisher would let me genre hop and it was sort of like, hey, like, I've got this, like, I hope you want it. Um, and really fortunately they were supportive of it and um, it's it's come to be, but I think fantasy, you know, like others have said, it's so much fun because you just can do whatever you want. I'm like, yes, let's make them winged lion shapeshifters. Let's live them, have them live in a city above the sea. Like, of course they do, you know, and this, it's so freeing. Um, it does come to bite you sometimes though when you make a rule of magic and then you have to live by it and then you're trying to like write yourself out of a situation by bending a rule and then your editor is like hey they can't do that or like this doesn't make sense and you're hoping they don't get spotted but of course they do so there's ups and downs but yeah fantasy is so much fun um, I, I do have a couple other fantasy ideas. I would love to write a rom-com someday. I, I love that sort of content. I like watching you know, romantic movies and, and reading books. And so I think that would be really fun. And then I have like, um, like a Lewis Sacker wayside story middle grade book kind of in my head that is contemporary, but like very silly. And so there are a bunch that um, I would love to dabble in. The one I know I will never do is um, like sci-fi because I feel like the science of it, of like, how do they breathe up there? Like, how do they, what's the technology like? I feel like there's too many things to research and learn. Um, and that's not how I like to, how I like to write. So I, I love reading sci-fi. I know I will never write it. And everything else is probably fair game. Okay. Oh my gosh. Oh. So let's. I know we could just spend like a year. I know days. there's just so much, so much information. Um. Okay. So, so. Um. Oh, here it is. 
what do you uh, hope that readers take away from your book? Um, so I guess it would be a little bit of what I mentioned before, the idea um, that change is possible. In this particular book, this particular series, The Seven Sins, there is a tremendous amount of societal and peer pressure to make certain choices, to live a certain way, to inform on the people around you, to do these things because there are very real, very dire consequences. Um, but yet my two main characters find the courage to unite with each other and to even discover that each other feel the same way, you know? And from that, they are brave enough to enact change. So I guess from this particular series, what I would love for readers to be able to take away is that it isn't easy to stand up when everyone around you is telling you that things need to be a certain way, but you feel in your heart that it isn't right. Um, it isn't easy to be the one to be different, especially when you know that there can be very real consequences for that. Um, it's very hard and you don't know when you do it that you're gonna end up being the hero of your story or anybody else's story. Um, but if you can find the courage to do that and to share your beliefs and find people who will be on your side, then incredible things can happen. So I guess that's what I'd like for people to take away. That sounds amazing. Um, I think I was looking at this question and I was like, I hope they skip that one. But um, <laughs> you guys didn't skip the one I wanted. Um, I, I, the thing I hope that people take away from my book is probably just that like people are all people and all should be valued for like where they are and what they believe. Um, there are a lot of very interesting characters with very conflicting beliefs, but they all manage to respect and be okay with each other. Um, I mean, not always, but um, that's something that I felt really strongly over the last like couple of years in this country. It feels like people are moving farther and farther away from where they can have real conversations together. And I feel like that is such a loss um, because most people have something good to bring to a conversation. And if, if the things that make us different make it impossible for us to talk at all, then we don't get to talk and that stinks. Um, and so I guess that's kind of what I hope people take that, that being different doesn't mean you can't be together or talk to each other or like have positive relationships in, in some capacity. I think for me, um, like I mentioned, my book is, is all about different forms of love. And so I hope that readers can feel sort of a reinforcement that their hearts are able to be trusted and the love that they feel and are putting out into the world is valuable and that the love that other people offer and give to them as, as long as it is you know, given respectfully and healthily is worth accepting. Um, so I, I think that for me is, is my biggest hope is that in this little book about love and a weird plague that there's still some hopefulness in the end that, that uh, we're all worthy of, of, of being able to, to feel and participate and, and have love for, for however our, our hearts may work and whatever we, however we may love. For me, I think I would love for readers to take away this feeling that you don't always have to do as you're told or you don't always have to believe what you're being told. Um, again, maybe this is my, my Catholic school resistance coming back and so grateful for my education, but you know, Rowan gets to the, my character gets to where she is in the book because she knows in her heart, she knows in her gut that like what she's being told to do is not right. And it doesn't sit well with her. And she sort of has to overcome this, this pain really of, of wondering what's going to happen to me when I break the rules, because I have to break the rules. And that's something that she struggles with. Um, and I hope readers, you know, you see that that's worth it. And that, that change and sort of challenging systems can really change everything and can really um you know keep your your conscience in a good place and to keep you feeling like your best self because if you just let others you know tell you what to do or how to do 
how to live your life, um, that's, that's not going to lead into a healthy, happy, successful place. So challenge what you know, you know, push boundaries and really trust your gut are the kind of takeaways that I would, I would love for readers to, to have in mind once they close that, that final cover. As I listened to you all answer that question, I was just thinking we should just have like a blind book display where it's like, this is how this book will make you feel. Like we're not gonna tell you what it's about. This is how you will feel after you've read it because just listening to them all, I was just like, I wanna feel like this all the time. It's like a combination of all of your books. I love it. Okay, so we have our last question and then we're gonna to get to our closing question. So we're almost there. Thank you so much for all of your time and all of your your wonderful answers. This is the question that we always ask at the end of our chats and it's our favorite and it makes us feel good and we hope that it makes you feel good sharing. So what is your favorite or favorite library or library memories? So if you have more than one, that's okay. Or if you can't think of one, just like a general love for libraries will also be acceptable. Um, well, I have one that's kind of funny, like it's like this very funny nostalgic memory for me. Um, so my elementary school was right around the corner from the library and, um, you know, when I, like years later when I was growing up, I uh, read The Time Traveler's Wife and there's this great line in there, I'm going to muck it up, but it's something like the main character viewing the library as this big beautiful box of books on Christmas morning. And that really is always how I have felt about the library ever since I was little, that I, I just can't believe that like the library is just here. Why is everybody not in here all the time? I don't understand. Like these books are here and what do you mean this isn't taken out yet? Don't you understand that this is like so exciting and you're going to open it and you're going to be transported to a whole new world like why is not everybody in here all the time like I always ever since I was little just had the feeling that when I opened the door to the library that I was kind of going into this secret world that somehow I was like super lucky to realize was this amazing awesome place and if everybody else knew how amazing and awesome it was they would be in there all the time too so I'd somehow like put something over on someone by being in there um and I so my elementary school was right around the corner from this library and um my mom always let me read whatever I wanted like she never put like any sort of limits if I wanted to read it that was totally fine she did not care one iota um which I think produced the same naivete as was present in that college class many years later when I said Anne Rice um I think that's a pattern um but I remember distinctly going Going every week they would take our little third or fourth grade class into the library and I read through all the kids books and like you know I have this big stack that's like bigger than my head and it, like books would be falling like to the left and the right as I like teetered to the counter and so I started I burned through all the Sweet Valley High books which are whatever they are and so then I started I remember this reading Harlequin romance in fourth grade it's I remember like the poor librarian her poor shocked look as I like and I was really small like super short so I teetered up with like every single category romance I could possibly hold and the, I remember the librarian just like looking at my teacher and looking and they called my mom I was like um your daughter has some very suspect tastes in literature and my mom was like it's a book, isn't it? And like, yes, it's it's a lot of books. It's all the books, really. Very inappropriate, smutty books. My mother was like, that's fine. They're books. Let her bring them home. So I, I will never forget, like, just like getting like all the funny looks as I was this little fourth grader that teetered out of the library with all those things. But I feel like inside me still is that like that sense of getting away with something every time I get a really great library haul. I have many, many library memories. Um, one of the first ones I can remember was walking into like my middle school library and um, seeing a, a shelf or like a little cart of books that were supposed to be shelved. And I saw a book that looked really super cool and I picked it up and I went and sat at a table and I just sat and read it like for an hour probably and just like fell right into the book. And I had read so, so, so many books but that was the first time I remember just like not even paying attention to the fact that the rest of my class was probably not reading about fantasy weird stuff, but were getting stuff for like their projects or whatever else. It was Ella Enchanted. And that's just the first book that I remember like just diving into and like not surfacing for a really long time. And it was at the library. And like, I've written all of my books at the library because that's the only place my kids can't find me. And like, I 
I, I love going and I love just being around all the books and I, it just feels like home. No matter where I go, I'm like, here's the library. I've moved lots of times in my life, but whenever I go to the library, I'm like, I'm okay, there are books here. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of library memories. We used to go um, a lot when I was a kid and just kind of, it, I felt like I was like being set free. It was like, okay, we're going to, you know, you're here for an hour and you just like go run to like the shelves of the kids section and like go try to find things that weren't there last week. Um, so I have many a fond memory as a child, um, but also when I was in college, I also was not the happiest uh, in college and kind of my safe place was the college library. Um, I was probably in there three, four times a week. It was a place I could go where I knew I would be safe, where I was okay to be alone. Everyone was quiet. Nobody was going to bother me. I could just be somewhere around people, but maybe not with people. And um, so I have not as many fond memories about college, but I have a lot of fond memories of the library specifically. So thanks libraries. I love that. Um, well, I've shared two of my memories of the library and I really do credit that again, when I was trying to pursue publishing, I don't know, like, I don't even know why I went to the long, the library first. Like, I think just subconsciously, I like knew that this was a place where similar, like no one was going to bother me. No one was going to question what I was looking up. And it just felt like a place that I could trust and, and get my bearings. Um, you know, before I was doing a bunch of research on the internet and I come back to that time and time again, it's probably the thing I talk about most in, in panels like these where it gave me the foundation to to know what to expect in publishing as, as, an, as a business and, you know, all those rejections that you get later, like I was ready for them because I read about them in my books from the library. Um, and then I think another one that I was remembering was when I was little, they did those, and I hope, I hope you all still do, are those um, like summer reading lists it was like, it was so exciting when that summer reading list came out and you could just go there and you're looking at these little bookmarks and you go for your right age and then you're walking around trying to find the books. Um, at my li library, I think you got like a little prize or something if you read a certain number of them. So I always remember doing that every summer. Um, and I see it now if I, you know, go into Barnes Noble or something, they have something similar about, uh, you know, reading books. And I'm like, I'm just so glad that like those lists and those sort of challenges are accessible to everybody at the library because it's free and it's a wonderful wonderful place to be and um yeah there's so many good ones we i love libraries <laughs> i just love hearing those and i always get so cheery every single time because i just can't help it <laughs> okay so we're going to go to our closing questions with kathy Okay, see, I never mute myself in any of my other stuff, so I always forget. Um, yeah, so uh, a few of you have mentioned your upcoming projects, um, but let us uh, tell us what is um, ooh, what's coming up for you. What's next for you? Um, sure. Okay, so um, the Seven Sins is a trilogy, um, and so. Um, the first book came out um, last August. And so the second one comes out August 3rd. So that's like the very next around the corner ish sort of a thing, uh, which is kind of terrifying and wonderful all at the same time. It's a little weird. I think like when a book comes out because you were working on it so long ago and then you're like onto the next thing and the book comes out. And for me, it's like going into the way back machine or something, I don't know. Um, so you're both like immersed in everything, like in the run up to it, but also creatively maybe like in, in a different space. So it's, it's a strange thing for me, um, but I'm so excited um, that it's gonna finally be in the world August 3rd. Um, and I'm writing the third book now, which will come out the final book in the trilogy, which will come out um, next summer. Um, and then I have um, an adult book, which also is, that's my, um, in the same theme of my romantic women's fiction with supernatural twists. Um, and that one is um, on submission right now, which is a special kind of torture for a writer, um, but that's where that is. And um, <clears throat> we've been um, going back and forth with an editor with lots of revisions. And so that is both terrifying and a big adventure. Um, so doing that and um, 
that is where I am. And then once I get this third book finished for the trilogy, um, like everybody talked about, I've got that book that's been like lurking up there in my head that, um, as I think Caitlin said, it like always pops up when there's something that you're supposed to be doing, you know, you should be doing And That's when the idea comes. So that one's been sitting there very patiently for a while. So that's like my little treat for myself when everything else is done. That's what I'm going to do. Love how all of us are like we don't want to be writing these books that we're really excited about we want to be writing these other books that we're really excited about yeah that's just the life of a writer right so the next thing i have coming up is she who rides the storm the one that i've been talking about this whole time it's coming out in september um i also have a middle grade so like ages 7 to 12 ish fantasy coming out this coming february that's called a baker's guide to robber pie and it is about a little baker who is really bored being a little baker. And she goes into the forbidden forest to find a magical creature to take on an adventure and find some robbers who want to kidnap her instead. So it's, um, it's very whimsical and silly. I wrote it right after reading Howl's Moving Castle for the first time and wanting to capture that whimsical, really ridiculous, but also really fun feeling. And I, I hope I did that. I don't know. It's probably my favorite book I've ever written. It took me years and years and years and years and years to get it right. It was that back burner book that I always wanted to be working on. Um, that I finally got into the right shape after like so many people helped and like oh it, it's just so exciting for it to be coming out finally. Um, I mentioned it briefly but um, Sweet and Bitter Magic has been out for I think four months now um, but already looking to next year which is wild that publishing works this way. Um, I, my second book is another standalone YA fantasy, Sophie and the Bone Song, um, about a girl who's been training her entire life to take over her father's title as the kingdom's premier lutenist. And on the day of audition, she loses to a girl who has never played the lute before. So she joins her on the road to try to prove that she's been using uh, illegal magic in her music, uh, but she learns some pretty shocking things about her family and herself instead. So that's coming out in April of 2022. That was a great pitch. Like I, I've read it before, but hearing you say it, I'm like, yeah, like I want that book. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, um, but The Endless Skies uh, comes out on August 17th. So similar to Emily, it's a sort of like weird crunch time where there's a lot happening, but also publishing works very far out. So I'm thinking about the future. Um, but it's, it's been a long time coming. It is my oldest story. And honestly, it just, I'm so excited for readers to have it. Like, that's just what I always come back to. And it feels really good when you finally are able to, to tell the story that's been in my head for, you know, eight years at this point. So I'm very excited about that. And then I've been working on, um, another, a house moving castle inspired kind of book. I just reread the book for, um, after a couple of years of not having read it, I rewatched the movie because I think both are independently excellent. Um, and so I'm writing a sort of a, a magical matchmaking. I kind of pitch it as like Bridgerton, but with magic and like a Howl's Moving Castle world. And um, it's been so fun. It's very different from either of my other books. It's a lot fluffier, a lot more fun. You know, there's a balls and dresses and like things like that. And so it's really been just like a joy. And I think it's probably inspired by the year we've just had where I'm like, I just want to write something fun and, and maybe not easy, but like something that readers can just like lose themselves in. So I'm um, really excited to keep working on that one and hopefully it will be on shelf someday. I love House of the Castle. So I'm just like, yes. The book and the movie. The movie is just great to have like in the background because the, the music is amazing. So that's the end of our questions and almost the end of the panel. Um, thank you for everyone watching now, watching later. Thank you so much to our authors for spending all this time with us and chatting with us. It's been just completely wonderful. I want to remind everyone that you can order and pre-order books by the authors from Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore. Right now, when you order um, books by Caitlin Sangster, I don't know if it's just the new one or if it's all of them. Um, they'll have signed book place. So just go to Mysterious Galaxy, all of them. Mm -hmm. So you should order all of them. That's, 
that is <laughs> that is the message. Order it's all the right answer. <laughs> Order them all. If you are interested in more chats and other free online programming, check out our Facebook events and our website to see what we have planned. And we hope to see you here on Facebook again on Thursday, August 19th at 4 p.m. for our next chat with authors like Nzia Kemp and Lori, Laura Taylor Navy. If you get a chance, please fill out our virtual program survey. Um, it's very helpful up for us. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so great to be here. Oh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. That was so fun. Thanks for having us.